So we just defined the GMM estimator in the last video, and now let's take a look at an example of, of applying the GMM estimator. In this case, we're gonna look at a two-stage least squares regression because it turns out that the two-stage least squares regression estimator is actually a special case of the GMM estimator. So let's consider that same general linear regression model that we did a couple of videos ago for OLS. We've just got our, our outcome Y. It's a linear function of beta and X plus uh, an idiosyncratic error term epsilon. But now we're going to assume that some of those X's are endogenous. So if we were to proceed with OLS estimation or even the GMM version of OLS that we talked through a couple of videos ago, our betas here would be biased and inconsistent if we wanted to give them a, a causal interpretation. But we can fix that if we have some exogenous instruments. So let's suppose we have a vector of L exogenous instruments that we're gonna call Z. And those exogenous instruments are correlated with X, but they're exogenous, so they're orthogonal to the error term. Just wanna say one thing about these Zs. These Zs can contain some of the same variables as X. If some of our independent variables, Xs, are exogenous, then they're surely correlated with our x's and they're exogenous. So we can also consider them z's. So there can be overlap between x and z. In fact, if you only have like one endogenous variable that you're worried about in your x's, all of your other x's, assuming that they are in fact exogenous, they could go into your instruments. You're just gonna need additional exogenous instruments to make sure you have enough instruments to identify your parameters. In this case, we're gonna need L instruments. Like I said, that can include independent variables that are exogenous. But we're gonna need L instruments where L is greater than or equal to K. If we have fewer instruments than parameters, we're, we're not identified. So we need at least as many instruments as parameters. So if these instruments are orthogonal to the error term, then we can write down that in expectation, any one of these instruments or every one of these instruments times epsilon equals zero in expectation. And we have L of these instruments. So we can think of having L moment conditions here. Every one of our instruments or variables, instrumental variables multiplied by epsilon equals zero in expectation. We can replace epsilon with Y minus the, the, the linear combination of beta and X. And to get this final expression on this slide, let's look a little more closely at it. What's inside the brackets here? Well, inside the brackets here, we have a function of our data, our Y's, our X's, and our Z's. All of our data are going in here. And it's a function of our betas. And in expectation, it equals zero. Those are gonna be population moment conditions. In this case, because we have L instruments, we're gonna have L population moment conditions that are functions of K parameters. So once again, we can take those population expectations and replace them with sample averages. So now we have the sample average of instrument times econometric residual. And we want that to equal zero. Every one of those to equal zero, right? Because they're going to be L instruments. So we're going to have L. This is a system of L equations. But we only have K unknown parameters. If L is greater than K, we cannot solve this system of L equations for K parameters. So instead, we're going to try to find the set of parameters that makes all of these conditions kind of as small as possible simultaneously. And, and more formally, what we're gonna do is find the set of parameters, which we'll call beta hat, that minimizes the weighted sum of squared sample moments. So we're gonna minimize this objective function where inside each one of these brackets is, the, uh, is our, our, our sample moments from up here. And then we just have this W weighting matrix in the middle that we're going to use to weight each one of those, uh, each one of those squared sample moments, and, and then sum them all up, and that's going to give us our objective function. Now let's just 
I think this highlights the fact here that our objective function depends on W. So our beta hat is going to depend on W. If we use a different weighting matrix, we are going to get a different GMM estimator. For every weighting matrix we plug in here, we are going to get a different GMM estimator. Maybe they're only going to be slightly different, but they will be different. In this case, it turns out if what we plugged in for W was uh, this uh, kind of the, the sum of squared instrument, like the, the data, then what we end up with is that our GMM estimator here is actually equal to the two-stage least squares estimator. So for that one particular choice of weighting matrix, our GMM estimator is the two-stage least squares estimator. Of course, you might wonder, what if we plugged in a different weighting matrix? And maybe you're even asking, well, is that the best weighting matrix to use? How do we even know what the best weighting matrix is? Uh, what kind of criteria would we even use to think about what's the best weighting matrix? Um, and, and in this particular case, which one, which weighting matrix might be better than the two stage, might give us an estimator that's better than the two stage least squares estimator. So in the next video, we're going to start answering those questions. We're going to start by talking about the properties of the GMM estimator. And then once we've established some of these properties, we can talk about uh, why we might choose one weighting matrix over another uh, in finding our GMM estimator. But first, we need to talk about the properties. And that'll be in the next video.